We now come to questions to the Prime Minister. And we start with Gagan Mahendra. Gagan. Number one, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I know colleagues across the House will wish to join me in paying tribute to our dear friend and colleague, Dame Cheryl Gillan, who sadly died last week, an MP for Chesham and Amersham for 29 years. She will be remembered for being a strong voice for her constituents, a brilliant campaigner, in including her advocacy for autistic people and their families, and for being the first female Secretary of State for Wales. I also want to pay tribute to Baroness Shirley Williams, uh, a pioneer for women in politics and in government, and to our former colleague Peter Ainsworth, who was passionate about his causes, especially the environment. Uh, Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, Dame Sherrill represented her constituents with considerable effectiveness for nearly 29 years and is all sorely missed in this place, especially by many of the newer members, as she was so kind to us in our first months in this place. Yeah. One of her passions was the protection of chalk streams, in particular the River Chess, which passes through my constituency of South West Hertfordshire. Many MPs are increasingly concerned about reports of partially treated sewage being released into our rivers, with knock-on health impacts for both humans and animals. Can my right honourable friend reassure this House that this government will actively protect our rivers and streams? Yeah. Mr Speaker, my honourable friend is entirely right to raise the uh, concern that we fully share about sewage overflow from uh, into rivers such as the, uh, the Chess, and uh, that's why uh, we have set up the Storm Overflows Task Force to uh, address the matter, uh, working with the water industry regulators uh, and environmental groups, and last month uh, we announced uh, legislation, uh, plans for legislation to address this very issue. Now come to the Leader of the Opposition. Right from Keir Starmer. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I join the Prime Minister in his remarks about Dame Cheryl Gillan, um, who I work with on a cross party basis and remember with fondness, and Ian Gibson, who also passed away this week, both commanded respect on all sides of this House and will be sadly missed. Can I also pay tribute to Shirley Williams? She was a great parliamentarian, a formidable minister, and cabinet minister. She loved this house, the other place, and frankly anywhere where she could debate ideas and politics. For many years she was Labour's loss. Today she is Britain's loss, and my thoughts are with her family and loved ones. Mr Speaker, does the Prime Minister believe that the current lobbying rules are fit for purpose? Uh, Mr Speaker, I, I, I uh, join... Uh, the right honourable gentleman in, in uh, what he said about uh, Ian Gibson and uh, I uh, uh, indeed share uh, the widespread concern about some of the stuff that we're reading at the moment Mr Speaker and I, I know that the Cabinet Secretary uh, shares uh, my concern as well. I do think it is a, a good idea in principle that uh, top civil servants should be able to engage with, uh, with business and should have experience of the private sector. Uh, when I look at uh, the uh, accounts I'm reading today, it's not clear that those boundaries were, uh, have been properly understood. And I've asked for a proper independent review of the arrangements that we have uh, to be conducted by uh, Nigel Baldman, and he will be uh, reporting uh, in June. And if he has any representations he wishes to make on that subject, he should do, uh, to mis do so to Mr Baldman. Stop. Mr Speaker, I know the Prime Minister is launching an inquiry. That inquiry isn't even looking at the lobbying rules. I'm not sure it's looking at very much at all. Because every day there's further evidence of the sleaze that's now at the heart of this Conservative government. Let's just look, shake your heads, let's just look at the latest scandal. A wealthy businessman, Lex Greensill, was hired as a senior advisor to David Cameron when he was Prime Minister. We've all seen the business card. After he left office, he, Cameron, became a paid lobbyist for Lex Greensill. 
Next thing we know, Cameron arranged access for Greensill with Cabinet Ministers, Ministers and senior officials. And he lobbied for taxpayers' money on behalf of Greensill Capital. We also know the Chancellor pushed officials. We know the Health Secretary met Cameron and Greensill. We know that senior officials met Greensill Capital regularly. And now, even more unbelievably, we know the government's former head of procurement, no less, became a Greensill advisor while he was still a civil servant. Does the Prime Minister accept there's a revolving door, indeed an open door, between his Conservative government and paid lobbyists? Uh, Mr Speaker, this is a uh, government and a party that has been consistently tough on uh, lobbying, uh, and indeed we introduced legislation uh, saying that there should be no taxpayer-funded lobbying, that quangos should not be used to get involved uh, with lobbying. Uh, we put in a register uh, for lobbyists, and there is one party, Mr Speaker, that actually voted to repeal uh, the 2014 Lobbying Act, and that was the Labour Party in their historic uh, 2019 election manifesto, which he has yet uh, to repudiate, uh, Mr Speaker. Uh, they did so because they thought it was unfair and was restricting people's ability to make representations uh, to politicians. I think that's absurd. Will he now say uh, that it's absurd to repeal the 2014 uh, Lobbying Act? Mr Speaker, he talks of the Lobbying Act. Who was it who introduced that legislation? David Cameron. Who was it who voted for the legislation? Half the Conservative front bench. We said it wouldn't be tough enough. And where did that legislation lead? Two years later, David Cameron camping out in a Saudi desert with Lex Greensill having a cup of tea. I rest my case in relation to that legislation. Let me try another very simple question. Is the Prime Minister aware of any other government official, any other government official who had commercial links with Greensill and, or any other lobbying role while working in government? Mr Speaker, or if he has any uh, such information, uh, he should of course make it uh, available to uh, Mr Borman. That's the point of his, uh, that's the point of his review. Uh, it's an independent review. It will be coming to me by, by June. I'll be glad it will, it will be played in the, uh, in the Library of the, of the House of Commons. It's all about lobbying, Mr Speaker. He's being advised uh, by Lord Mandelson of Global <laughs> Council Limited. Uh, perhaps in the interests of full transparency, so we can know uh, where he's coming from, Lord Mandelson could be encouraged uh, to disclose his other clients, Mr Speaker. Yes, Mr Speaker, I haven't heard a defence that ridiculous since my last days in the Crown Court. It's, it's called the shoplifter's defence. Everyone else is nicking stuff, so why can't I? Mr Speaker, it never worked. I remind the Prime Minister, I not only prosecuted shoplifters, I prosecuted MPs over the MPs' expenses scandal. So I stand on my record. That line just isn't going to wash with me. It was a former Prime Minister, and I, I suspect now a former lobbyist, uh, who once said, this isn't a minor issue with minor consequences. Government contracts potentially worth hundreds of billions of pounds are at stake. So can the Prime Minister now answer the question the Chancellor's been ducking for weeks? How was it, how was it that Greensill Capital, a company employing David Cameron, got the green light to give hundreds of millions of pounds of taxpayer-backed loans? Uh, Mr Speaker, whilst he was prosecuting MPs, I was uh, cutting crime in London by 23% and cutting the murder rate uh, by, 20, by 50%. And he, you know, he, asks, he asks about uh, uh, lobbying on behalf of, of Greensill. Uh, Mr. Speaker, and I, you know, again, I don't, want to, I don't wish to embarrass the right honourable gentleman, but he doesn't have far to look. It, it was, there, was, there was one person asking for the Greensill Bank uh, to be able to use the coronavirus business interruption loan scheme, and that was the Shadow Defence Secretary, Mr. Speaker. This gets weaker and weaker. It does take me back to my defence defence case in the Crown Court. Just ridiculous. The, sh the Shadow, the shadow Defence Secretary. The shadow, it really wasn't a good point. If you think that's a good point, you've got real problems. Um, shadow shadow Defence Secretary was speaking for his constituents and, and for local jobs. That is a mil that is million miles away from being a paid lobbyist texting friends in government. 
The Prime Minister says this came to be an inquiry, but the person he's appointed worked for the same law firm which lobbied to loosen lobbying laws. You couldn't make it up. What we need, what we need is to overhaul the whole broken system. This afternoon, Labour's motion calls for a proper parliamentary inquiry into this scandal. If the Prime Minister is so concerned about this, he should welcome the motion. After all, to quote David Cameron, his old school friend, sunlight is the best disinfectant. So will the Prime Minister vote with Labour today for a full, transparent, independent inquiry? Uh, Mr Speaker, I think he would have been better off supporting the uh, lobbying act, and the Labour Party would have been uh, better off not uh, campaigning to get rid of it. It's, uh, it toughens up our, our laws, and uh, Mr Speaker, I think that his own, his own proposal is simply to have, yet again, to have politicians marking their own homework. What the country wants, that's all it is, a committee of MPs uh, to look at it, uh, it won't do a blind bit of good. That's why we're having a proper independent review. Uh, if he has any representations or allegations to make uh, about what has taken place, he should make them uh, to the eminent uh, lawyer who's been asked to do it. He'll be reporting uh, to us uh, by June. Yes, Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister should be voting with us, not blocking a proper inquiry. The Greensill scandal is just the tip of the iceberg. Dodgy contracts, privileged access, jobs for their mates. This is the return of Tory sleaze. Mr Speaker, it's now so ingrained in this Conservative government. We don't need another Conservative Party appointee marking their own homework. Actually, Mr Speaker, the more I listen to the Prime Minister, the more I think that Ted Hastings and AC12 are needed to get to the bottom of this one. Mr Speaker, we know the Prime Minister will not act against Slees, but this House can. So can I urge all members of this House to come together this afternoon to back Labour's motion and start to clean up the Slees and cronyism that's at the heart of this Conservative Government? Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, that's why we're putting in an, uh, an independent uh, review. Uh, that's why we have tougher laws on our lobbying. A great shame uh, that Labour opposed them. Uh, Mr Speaker, yes, we are getting on with rooting out bent coppers, Mr Speaker. Uh, we're, also, we're also appointing and hiring thousands more police officers. Mr Speaker, we're fighting crime. We're fighting crime on the streets of, uh, of our cities. Uh, whilst they opposed the police and crime bill, which would have put in tougher sentences for serious sexual and violent offenders. Absolutely. And they then encouraged people who went out and demonstrated uh, uh, Mr Speaker, to kill the bill. Uh, we're getting on with protecting the public. Of the, that's absolutely correct, Mr Speaker. We're getting on with protecting the public of this country from crime of all kinds. Uh, we're getting on with the job of running this country, of rolling out a vaccination programme. Or, 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 Prime Minister, I think we ought to at least try and address the question. <laughs> Bill Russell. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, it's, been a, it's been a year this week since I had the privilege of starting to volunteer at Watford General Hospital. And over this time, I've been fortunate and privileged to work along some inspiration on selfless volunteers. So as the nation reflects this week on the importance of schemes to support young people, may I ask the Prime Minister if he would meet with me to explore the creation of an NHS cadet scheme to pay tribute to those who have already volunteered over the past year and also create a lasting legacy for generations to come. Thank you. Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, thank you. Uh, I thank my, my honourable friend for what he's doing. I thank everybody at uh, Watford General Hospital for the support they've given uh, throughout the pandemic and uh, particularly, Mr Speaker, the, the volunteers who play a massive part in our uh, vaccination uh, rollout programme. And I, I fully support the NHS uh, cadet scheme, uh, part of our work to establish a volunteering legacy for young people from the pandemic. Leader of the SNP, Ian Blackford. Uh, more than time, uh, Mr Speaker, can I associate myself with the remarks of the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition on Dame Cheryl Delvin and uh, of Shirley Williams? Mr Speaker, the Scottish Government has passed landmark legislation embedding the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child into Scots law. A real revolution in children's rights. Every party in the Scottish Parliament supported it, even the Scots Tories. It has been welcomed everywhere, except here in Westminster. Instead of supporting this new law, the UK Government is shamefully taking the Scottish Parliament to court 
in order to strike it down. Apparently, the only basis of the UK government's legal case is that the law constrains Westminster powers. So, Prime Minister, can you do everyone a favour by explaining how protecting children's rights in Scotland threatens the Tory government in London? Uh, Mr Speaker, this is complete nonsense. Uh, the Government of the United Kingdom uh, ratified the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child uh, 30 years ago. Uh, we all support it. It has nothing to do with the, uh, nothing to do with the rights of, of vulnerable children, which we all uh, protect. This is simply an attempt by the SNP to stir up constitutional chaos and uh, create another, another fictitious a uh, fictitious bone of contention between themselves and, uh, and the rest of the country. If they really cared about the rights of the child, Mr Speaker, they would do much more to improve education in Scotland, uh, where they are so lamentably uh, failing, Mr Speaker. Ian Blackford. The rights of the child, an act passed by the Scottish Parliament, supported by every party, and his government is taking our Parliament, our government, to court. Yeah. Mr Speaker, there's nothing technical about this, and the Westminster government wants to strip away the rights of children in Scotland. This is a tale of two governments. We have an SNP Scottish government delivering the baby box, doubling the Scottish child payment and providing free school meals to every primary school child. At the same time, this Tory government is robbing children of their rights in Scotland. Quite simply, Mr Speaker, the SNP Scottish government has and will continue to work to ensure Scotland is the best place for a child to grow up. This legal challenge threatens that. It is wrong and it is morally repugnant, Prime Minister. Will the Prime Minister commit to withdrawing his legal challenge today? If not, we'll see you in court. Well, Mr Speaker, the best thing they can do, as I say, for the rights of the child uh, in Scotland is to improve their shameful record on, uh, on education and to, and, and, and to tackle the issues that matter to the people of Scotland, uh, to tackle uh, the, t the tax regime that they put in place, uh, to, do, to do better on fighting crime and drug addiction in Scotland. Uh, they should be looking at the issues that really matter, uh, in my view, to the people of, of Scotland. And instead, they're going into uh, the elections next month, which will be yet again on a campaign to break up this country. That's all they can think of. Break up this country, call for a referendum, get, uh, uh, break up this country, destroy our country, and call a referendum. Uh, in a way that I think is completely irresponsible at a very difficult time where we want to bounce back stronger together. Let me judge. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The uh, A55 expressway is of huge importance to North Wales, linking the region to the main motorway network. It is also, as was noted in the recent interim report on the Union Connectivity Review, the principal freight artery for the port of Holyhead. The road is in desperate need of improvement and has been for many years. So uh, will my right honourable friend confirm that the government will make it a priority to use its powers uh, under the UK Internal Market Act to upgrade the road for the benefit of the people of North Wales? Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I thank my right honourable friend. He's completely right. And the, uh, Sir, Sir Peter Hendy has, has rightly identified the uh, potential of the, uh, of the A55 and I think the best thing the people of, of Wales can do to guarantee uh, these vital upgrades is to a, elect a Welsh Conservative uh, Government on May the 6th. We now go to Vicky Foxcroft. Vicky, I understand you're going to sign. Can you speak and sign at the same time for all our benefits? Vicky Foxcroft. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And if the Prime Minister doesn't understand, imagine how those who rely on British Sign Language feel at his press briefings. 2.6 million spent on the new press room, yet still no interpreter. What message does he think this sends to disabled people? Uh, I'm, I'm grateful to the uh, Honourable Lady and, great, and grateful for the uh, for the, 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 the way she has uh, set out her question, I will, I will revert to her as, as soon as I can. Sarah Dyche. Thank you, 
Mr Speaker, does my right honourable friend agree with me that it is thanks to the sacrifice of the British people during lockdown and the great success of the vaccination programme that lots of small businesses across the whole country and in my constituency in Derbyshire Dales, like Brocklehurst, who supplied clothing to the Duke of uh, Prince Philip, that they can remain open? Will he join with me in a campaign to shop local as we come out of lockdown? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I thank my honourable friend and uh, I can tell her that, uh, yes I certainly will uh, encourage her to, uh, and everybody else to shop uh, local as we come out of, uh, of lockdown and uh, as I very much hope that we will be able to, to do and uh, my run on friend the community's secretary has announced uh, £830 million pounds of funding uh, from the future uh, High Streets Fund has been allocated to uh, areas including her own in order to encourage uh, that shopping uh, that we all hope and want to see. Ruth Thank you, Mr Speaker. May I extend my condolences and those of my constituents uh, to the Queen and to the Royal Family for their sad loss and also to the families and colleagues of Cheryl Gillam and Shirley Williams. Will the Prime Minister tell this House when he last spoke to former Prime Minister David Cameron. The honest truth, I cannot remember when I last spoke to, to Dave, but I can, if, she, if she wants to know whether I've had any contact with him uh, about any of the matters uh, that, uh, that have been in the press, the answer is no. Other host of Peter Bottom. Mr. Speaker, those who helped to develop, to test, to approve and manufacture the vaccines deserve our praise. Will my right friend also recognise the successful rollout of the vaccination programme has been based on the dedication of the NHS staff and the myriads of volunteers who made the process so easy for so many people. Uh, my right honourable friend is, is uh, completely right. This has been a colossal team effort. It has been led by the NHS with uh, GPs uh, very often doing the lion's share of the work, but they've been supported by uh, by the army, uh, by local council uh, officials who have also been absolutely magnificent uh, and, uh, as uh, colleagues have said earlier, uh, by volunteers as well. 16 withdrawn, so we go up to Dr James Dennis. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The interim findings of Sir Peter Hendy's Union Connectivity Review are very much to be welcomed. Um, he highlights the improvements that need to be made to the railways in North Wales linking up with Merseyside and Manchester, as well as the A55. These, of course, can help to level up the region. Will my right honourable friend confirm that the identified projects within Sir Peter Hendy's work in North Wales will receive a fair chunk of the £20 million of uh, development funding as part of the uh, agenda? And will he commit to implementing the findings of Sir Peter Hendy's uh, final report when it's released in the summer? I thank my honourable friend. Uh, we, will, uh, we will look at what uh, Sir Peter has to say. I think he's uh, come up with some very interesting interim uh, proposals, particularly about uh, improving uh, connectivity along the North uh, Wales coastline, the, the, the routes into, uh, into Merseyside. And on the A55, I, I, I repeat what I said uh, to, uh, to my right honourable friend earlier on. There is a great opportunity uh, to do that if people will vote Conservative uh, and uh, vote for a Welsh Conservative government on May the 6th, Mr Speaker. Let's go to Howell Williams. Howell. Thank you, Mr Speaker. In 2007, uh, my friend Adam Price, then the member for Carmarthen East and Dinevor, uh, proposed an elected representative's prohibition of deception bill. At this distance in time, it would be well, unkind to quiz the Prime Minister on the detail, because he is seen as a big thinker, so today perhaps he could tell the House what he thinks of the principle of that bill, which is that on important matters of public policy, politicians must not lie. Uh, well, I certainly agree. I, I have a high regard for uh, the, the Honourable Gentleman, and, and indeed, I remember uh, the happy, happy times with uh, his, uh, his colleague uh, uh, Adam Price. Uh, I, I don't remember the details of his bill, but I think, Mr Speaker, we will all concur with the basic principle uh, that uh, he's just uh, enunciated. Esther Back. Thank you, Mr Speaker. 
Former police inspector Cash Singh set up One Britain, One Nation, otherwise known as Obon, to bring together all communities, all classes, all ethnicities, races and religions to celebrate being British. Obon Day is held in June. However, next week, on April the 22nd, will be the launch of it at a school in Bradford. Will the Prime Minister join me in congratulating Cash Singh for his fantastic initiative to, uh, for all communities to come together in a common pride of being British? And will he also make a message for the launch next week? Uh, well, uh, well I said, yeah, I'll do my best, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and I, I, but uh, you know, I, I fully support what she's doing, and I, and I, I congratulate uh, Cash Singh on uh, on his on his work. And it is incredible at this time, Mr. Speaker. There are people who want to uh, split our country up uh, rather than uh, than bring us uh, together. That's what they want. I think it's an absolute absolute tragedy uh, that they still think like that. I think they're going to change, uh, Mr. Speaker. But I wish everybody at Obon all the very best. Jim Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And contrary to the conclusions of the Race and Ethnic Disparity Report, institutional racism still exists. And 40 years since the Liverpool 8 uprisings, black communities continue to suffer racial injustice. And the report downplays the structural inequalities that still exist. The Resolution Foundation announced today that unemployment rate for young black people rose by 35%, compared to 30% for their white counterparts. Can the Prime Minister confirm the allegations that Downing Street redrafted the report to change the narrative and does he agree with me that this report should now be withdrawn? Thank you. Well, uh, I thank the Honourable Lady, but actually uh, when you look at the report and read it uh, in detail, there's not everything that this government is going to agree with, of course not. Uh, there are some interesting uh, observations, some interesting uh, ways of, of looking at, at things, and uh, we will be responding in due course, but what we say uh, is that nobody should be in any doubt as to the reality of racism, uh, to the reality of the struggle uh, that too many people uh, face, and we are going to do everything we can uh, to stamp it out, and particularly to help uh, young black people get the jobs, get the education that they need. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As my right honourable friend will know, as we build back better, we need to inspire the next generation of scientists and engineers. We therefore agree to work with Engineering UK and Big Bang Digital to provide a short online introduction to this year's event to reinforce the message that a career in engineering is rewarding, it's creative and can transfer, transform the world around us for the better. And will you recognise the extraordinary contribution engineers have made and are making in our battle against COVID? I thank my friend because engineers have obviously been crucial and scientists of all kind in the fight against, uh, against COVID. And this is the moment, uh, Mr. Speaker, to, to be, become an engineer or to work towards being an engineer. We're putting a huge £640 billion investment uh, into uh, the infrastructure of this country over the next, uh, over the next few years. We're going to need skilled young people uh, to be going into engineering. That's why we put in the, the T levels. I, I congratulate uh, my honourable friend on his initiative. I will do my best uh, to support him. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Given his ancestry, the Prime Minister will be more than familiar with the phrase, a fish rots from the head down, it is a Turkish problem. Put simply, since he became the Prime Minister, the sound of Big Ben's bombs has been replaced by the cash till sound of big donor bums. There's been a threefold increase in bums from property developers. Last summer, we had the case of Richard Desmond and the Community Secretary. More recently, we've had ministers dishing the dosh between community constituencies and a health secretary handing or involved in a contract with his pub landlord for £30 million pounds worth of PPE. Now we have a chancellor and health secretary that have sought to grease the wheels of involvement with Greensill and David Cameron. What does this say about the Prime Minister's leadership of his government? Uh, Mr Speaker, I'm afraid I, I, he is, is simply wrong in what he says, and particularly about uh, what he says about the Chancellor, my final for the Chancellor and, and the Health Secretary, and, and, and I don't believe that he should have spoken in, the, in those terms, Mr Speaker. But uh, what I will say uh, is that uh, you know, there, there is one party in this uh, place that brought in tough 
rules on lobbying. Uh, and there's another party uh, that, 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 that campaigned at the last election uh, to get rid of those rules because of their relationship with the trades unions, Mr. Speaker, because they wanted them to continue in the obscure, opaque way that they were being run, uh, and because they wanted people to be able to continue uh, to lobby parliamentarians in the way that they always did. And look at their Labour manifesto of 2019, Mr. Speaker. If he repudiates it now, why don't go ahead and do so? Another question from Gareth Davies. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Over the last few months, a number of my constituents have taken to the streets to help tackle the problem of littering, and I pay particular tribute to those constituents in Colesworth who I met with recently. Will the Prime Minister join me in backing the Grantham Journal's Spring Clean campaign, and can he assure my constituents the Government are doing all it can to help tackle littering? Uh, I, I share, Mr. Speaker, uh, his uh, indignation about litter. Uh, I do think it's one of the things on which uh, the whole of the country and the, I hope the whole of the House uh, is, is united. Uh, that's why we're doing the Respect the Outdoors campaign to encourage people to follow the, the countryside code to pick up their, their litter. Obviously, a lot of people are meeting outdoors at the moment, Mr. Speaker, uh, because of the pandemic. They must uh, obey uh, the basic uh, laws of respect for other people pick up their, uh, their litter. Uh, we, we're, we're putting money into new, uh, into new litter bins. And yes, Mr. Speaker, we are increasing fines on the spot, uh, fines uh, for littering. I know that uh, uh, there will be many libertarians in this place who think that's unfair and, and draconian. Uh, personally, Mr. Speaker, I think it's the right thing to do. I abhor litter, and I urge anybody who sees anybody throwing away a crisp packet to tick them off and tell them to pick it up, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> I am now suspending the House for three minutes to enable necessary arrangements to be made for the next business order.